Are we ready to go? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for Dr. C's much anticipated talk, a joint venture sponsored by the UMIH and Surge Critical Environments Research Group. My name is Serenity Jew, and I am the current director of the UMIH. Surge is represented by Dr. Bruce Erickson, one of my favorite collaborators who's in the room today, I think. Um, Ekana Emeka Maduka is the producer of today's Zoom with the support of our fabulous ASL interpreters. Many thanks to all for making this event possible today. I remind us that the UMIH is located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and we are also situated on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Please feel free to write in the comments whose lands you are joining us from today as a small gesture toward acknowledging the ongoing processes of both settler colonial dispossession and struggle that mark the specific and rooted spaces from which we make our lives and livelihoods as indigenous peoples, settlers, or visitors, both distinctly and collectively. Many of you may remember that Dr. C's talk was originally scheduled for last fall. There's a content warning here. You, you, UMFA very dramatically went on strike a mere few days before her talk. And so we are very pleased and honored that she was able to make time in her demanding schedule to return back to us today. Dr. Julie C is professor of American studies at the University of California, Davis. She is the author of three significant groundbreaking books, the award-winning Noxious New York, The Racial Politics of Urban Health and Environmental Justice, published by MIT Press in 2006, Fantasy Islands, Chinese Dreams and Ecological Fears in an Age of Climate Crisis, published by University of California Press in 2015, and most recently, Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger, published by University of California Press in 2020, which has been assigned reading in several classes at the U of M recently. She's also the author of over 60 articles and book chapters on environmental studies broadly conceived and is the founding director of the Environmental Justice Institute. In her most recent book, which begins with a nod to Stevie Wonder's Saturn, which I had plans to play for you today, but you can just pretend that I'm singing it to you. She examines the long, long history of social justice movements by Black, Indigenous, and POC organizers in order to examine how, quote, organizers, community, communities, and movements fight, survive, love, and create in the face of environmental and social violence that challenges the very conditions of life itself. How do we transcend bitterness and cynicism and embrace love, hope, and an all-encompassing dream of freedom, especially in these rough times? In this spirit of fighting, surviving, loving, and creating, in these rough times, please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie C. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I, today, uh, my campus actually went on strike too, so I feel like it's just karma, you know, bringing us together. Um, thank you again. I had a chance to meet Professor Drew um, last week um, at our annual at an annual meeting. Um, and it was nice to put a name to a face, um, and also to um, Akeen and, uh, and the ASL interpreters. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. So thank you again for that um, introduction. Let me share my screen. Oh, we were just saying that you know we are out of practice with Zoom very quickly, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So uh, give me a second. Uh, okay. So um, today's talk uh, is on climate justice and just transitions, um, but it's through the Institute of the Humanities. So in that spirit, I will um, have it be a very interdisciplinary talk. Um, I wanted to, um, let me go, okay. So the talk overview today. Um, this book, uh, this talk is based on the um, new work that I'm doing, uh, which is a short book on critical climate justice. Um, and it's um, it's going to be through the University of Minnesota Press in Theory. Um, and this talk will theorize what I call critical climate justice as an analytic that links political and cultural struggles for decarbonization, decarceration, and demilitarization 
and against dominance within um, the theoretical frameworks of decolonialism and abolitionism to argue simply that climate justice is a freedom struggle. And for those of you who follow environmental justice um, scholarship, the idea of critical environmental justice scholarship um, really draws, of course, from David Pellow's critical environmental justice. And so what he tries to do and what I'm trying to sort of parallel is to think about what it means um, as these terms like environmental justice and climate justice become broadly available um, as languages. Um, but to put in, putting in the critical part of it means to think more um, now more people understand, oh, environmental justice, um, climate justice, these are things that um, are more well known than they have ever been um, in the last like four decades or so. But we, you know, both he and I together and with many others are trying to think about the critical part of that. Um, the argument is very simply that as a freedom struggle, critical climate justice focuses on both freedoms, which are negative freedoms, um, freedoms from things like racial capitalism, settler colonialism, and colonial extraction, but also positive freedoms to love, regenerate, live, and practice community and solidarity. So this talk today is going to introduce some key documents from frontline climate justice um, alliances. Um, to think about what a just transition framework is. So just transition alongside with um, climate justice or environmental justice are um, terms that are being used very, uh, more frequently and in many different contexts. So what I really want to talk about is, again, identifying what's a critical climate justice and what does it mean to um, situate it in that way. So the talk summary um, will try to introduce how prisons, policing, and the military are linked as um, institutions that are tied to practices, histories, policies, and attitudes, um, and that these are very much tied to a broad socio-political economic agenda. So it's not just about carbon, in, in other words, but about human domination over nature, fossil fuel extraction, of course, but also white supremacy. And that to understand critical climate justice, we have to understand all of these forces and histories together. Um, I draw heavily on climate justice activists and movements. I work primarily within the US, but it is not a US centric or US only um, movement or term. Um, but the ones that I'm most familiar with within the US use the term frontline and sometimes frontline fence line um, in order to foreground how issues of race, class, indigeneity, citizenship, and gender highlight the disparities of who is most impacted and, um, I'm sorry, least responsible. That's an error. Most impacted and least responsible. So frontline and fence line climate justice activists use a transnational framework to dis to distinguish their position against mainstream technologically driven conversations around climate policy. So it's not just you know looking at carbon per se or looking um, up in the sky as uh, my colleague uh, activist uh, Gopal Dayanani says. You know we cannot look up into the atmosphere. We have to look down into the ground. So as such, critical climate justice is a radical theory of enchantment that moves from hierarchical and global white supremacist visions of carbon, military, policing, and prisons, and human hierarchy over nature um, in order to bring us into an emancipatory future. So today's questions, um, very simply put, are what is critical climate justice and why does it matter? What is just transition within that framework and what's the role of culture and organizing? And really the big question is what does freedom look like now in the face of environmental and state violence and climate change in its myriad forms, surveillance, militarization, and policing across borders? So what I'm going to talk um, to do in the next um, bit of time I have is to use this outline. Um, to talk for very briefly about environmental racism and climate injustice as a form of violence, um, to think about environmental, uh, and this will draw primarily from the most recent book, Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger, um, to talk um, from violence to thinking about freedom um, and critical climate justice as a freedom movement using examples from just transition framework and abolitionist climate justice movements and leave a lot of time for Q and A. Okay, so climate justice as in as in um, as violence. Um, the United States and the world is burning, flooding, and exploding. Authoritarianism is linked with um, racism, anti-immigration, anti-refugee sentiment, gender violence, militarism, and corporate capitalism. That crises are interconnected, 
police and state sanctioned violence, pandemic and public health, and climate disaster is apparent to many around the world who protest against fascist and extreme economic and social inequality made worse under COVID. The climate crisis um, has come home in the shape of hurricanes, heat waves, and wildfires, and the old political order is crumbling. But what takes place now is under fierce struggle. The action is both in the streets, in the classrooms, and in the stories that shape and are shaped by government chambers and corporate boardrooms. So when Donald Trump, when he was president, came to California after the wildfires, he put the blame on Californians for not raking its leaves, despite the fact that 50% of the forests in California are under federal control. He, in a common delusion that mixes weather and climate said, and this is a quote from uh, Trump, it's getting cooler. Despite a president and millions of Americans, including the political infrastructure of the Republican Party, facts um, still do matter, whether that you're talking about COVID or climate change. COVID-19 will not magically go away due to the weather or drinking bleach, and climate disaster will not disappear because you wish it to be so. It seems horrific and depressing to say this explicitly, but acting as if facts and science don't exist only makes the problems worse. Denial is a prison and we need freedom now. We are dying in a warming world that colonialism created, that industrial modernity made worse, and which transnational corporations under neoliberalism is trying to finish off. We also, of course, live in a rich and beautiful world made even more precarious under all of these threats, environmental or otherwise. So this talk again focuses on a very specific standpoint, that of climate um, justice movements. Um, and climate justice movements focus sharply and with laser-like precision on is issues of power, history, and knowledge. And so the um, arguments today echo those made in the climate justice movements, specifically those that emphasize the frontline and fence line perspectives. Um, these movements are comprised and led by people of color, indigenous peoples, and the poor in what some are now calling the people of the global majority. Um, environmental justice um, activists use, um, have for 30 or so years insisted that the environment is where we live, work, play, and pray, and we speak for ourselves. Environmental justice advocates conceptually frame the environmental problems and their roots with racial, socioeconomic, and political inequalities um, in toxicity, pollution, and climate change. Climate justice movements reject climate change, its causes and responses as divorced from history, politics, economic domination, and how these saturate and remake social, global, and racial inequalities. They reject um, issues like air, water pollution, pesticides, toxicity, siting, and drought as separate from each other, or from domains of public health and land use, and is divorced from the structure of economic and political life. So what does it mean to say climate justice, um, injustice is violence? Um, we could see this in terms of um, uh, disasters, impacts, and injustices. Um, and of course, many of you are familiar with, you know, this is obviously not an issue just of carbon. You know, this, the great acceleration is looking at, you know, lots of different um, indicators in the sort of 1950 as a global point. Um, so the uh, climate justice movements um, really foreground their uh, argument that frontline community-based organizations, and this is a uh, quote, have the um, solutions for the extractive industrial systems that are eroding humans' primary means of existence on the planet. Going back to carbon, what are the impacts? Um, this is the cover of a World Meteor Meteorological Organization report, Climate Risks, Extreme Events, and Related Impacts. I mean, most of you are fairly familiar with all of these. Um, heat waves, displacements, ocean acidification, um, agriculture, uh, et cetera. Another visualization of the impacts, um, you know, this is from the British geographer of what will happen at two degrees, 1.5, 5, et cetera. Um, Okay, so where are the injustices? Um, simply, simply put, the idea, you know, that the climate justice movement, and you know, we're, there's a summit right now, is that climate change will expand and magnify the inequality. Um, many of you are already familiar with this. Is you know, the basically red is sort of negative um, impacts, and if you look at this, the negative impacts are mostly in the global south, which historically has produced a lot less of the emissions. Um, climate justice globally um, 
are anti-racist in their rejection of white supremacy and anti-blackness, decolonial in their centering of indigeneity, feminist in orientation. They bend sometimes towards anti-capitalist critique of marketization, consumerism, and militarization, and of oil and gas um, cultures. Environmental justice movements have long argued for making connections that exceed and defy these uh, binaries, social and environment, for instance, and the capitalist common sense. In a brutalizing era focused on death and natural resource extraction and punctuated by a never ending litany of apocalyptic scientific forecasts, climate justice movements contribute their stories, histories, and their justice oriented worldviews based on intersectional analyses that span historical time and geographic space. And so I'll just say this um, briefly. When I was in the in the 90s, I was an organizer with a group called the Environmental Justice um, Alliance. And there was a coalition called the Environmental Justice and Climate Change Coalition. And in 1997, they had this fact sheet that said, what would happen if a hurricane hit New Orleans? Um, and again, this is 97, Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005. Um, and I remember reading it in 1997 and saying, oh, this, this can't happen. This is not going to happen, in part because I did not have the experience or the lived the lived experience or the analytic ability to imagine um, the devastation of um, Hurricane Katrina. And of course, everything that they said in 1997 is exactly how it played out in 2005. Now, I think we have accepted, normalized um, that there are um, these kind of catastrophic um, hurricane um, and disasters, um, not just Katrina, but Rita, Maria, Sandy, Harvey, Irma, um, et cetera. Um, but I, I like to tell my students and others this because I think there was a way in which there was kind of, in some ways, an innocence if you weren't directly impacted um, by this kind of environmental violence. Um, so environmental justice is um, a, a, a question of distributive um, inequities. Um, it's a question of procedural inequities um, in terms of who gets to participate um, and also in disaster planning. Um, but looking at basically dimensions of power um, in uh, what the problems are and how our solutions or um, going to be addressed. Environmental justice as a movement has been deeply synergistic. Um, and this is even more true and an even more important lesson in the in an era of um, climate, climate change and COVID. And extraction makes everything worse, in other words. These are, um, let me see. These are some more images um, from the book that I talk about in the third chapter on climate justice. And Colleen um, Swan is an art in Inupiaq um, uh, leader in um, Alaska who is um, fighting uh, in Kivalina. Uh, she um, was in, uh, they, they sued 25 oil and gas companies for the harm that they their homeland is already being washed away to, um, from sea level rise. The middle picture is from an uh, amazing called Trouble the Water, which is on Hurricane Katrina, which I teach in my uh, class. And if you haven't you know, watched it, I really recommend it. Um, and the just transition principles I'll get to in a second. Um, so these are, I think, very interesting in terms of thinking about COVID and climate change. Um, the idea of like bending the climate curve um, and bending the COVID rates is actually very similar um, conceptually. Um, so again, climate change um, will expand and ma magnify inequality. So that's um, the first section about environmental racism and climate injustice and violence. Let me talk briefly about um, environmental justice in a moment of danger. Um, so this is um, my most recent book, um, and it comes out of the American Studies Now series. Um, it's a short kind of teachable um, book that focuses on specific case studies and keywords um, to think about the significance of environmental justice now. And obviously, you know, the moment of danger I wrote about had nothing to do with COVID, but COVID I think exacerbates um, this in many ways. Uh, the royalties for this book go to two organizations that I've worked with, um, in one case in Uprose since I was um, like 27 years. 
um, and the Community Water Center in Visalia, which is um, a focus of the book as well. So the key word, uh, the key questions in that book are what crossroads and moment of danger are we in now? And what might we learn from environmental justice movements in our moment of danger? Um, the, the idea is that we are in a new and familiar crossroads and moment of danger, um, including, you know, carbon, but also, you know, political structures, um, the populist authoritarianism, militarized security discourse, and racist policies, which are not just, you know, any, not just Trump, you know, it's not in, just in the US, it's in Brazil and India and Hungary, et cetera. Um, the structure of the book is looking at um, kind of iconic um, struggles, which many people are more familiar with, um, linking it with an anchor organization and some key words from scholarship. So, um, you know, I, I always like to tell my students that, you know, they're the first like 10 years of my career as a student studying race, poverty, and environment. A lot of the debates were really simply focused on whether there was such a thing as environmental inequality or health inequality. Again, I'm talking like 30 years ago. Um, and this is pre GIS, pre internet. So there was a lot of focus in the early years, which was just about empirical documentation. Was it true? Now there has been so much research that basically, you know, that's not really what the argument is about. It's not about empirical documentation, um, but about sort of what to do um, with that um, knowledge and how policy and social movements um, shape uh, are shaped now. Um, my students know much more going in to the university about Standing Rock, about um, about uh, Flint. Um, and so on. So this is the, it's a very short, again, readable book. Uh, the first chapter looks at Standing Rock, um, Tar Sands Keystone, and looks at the keywords of settler colonialism, extraction, gender violence, and the anchor network is the indigenous environmental network. The second chapter looks at water racism um, and justice, uh, looking at Flint, Michigan, which was, you know, I think many of you already know the mass poisoning of a majority poor, um, slightly majority African American city in Michigan. Um, looking at the key words of privatization, neoliberalism, and the anchor organization is the Community Water Center. The third chapter looks at these kind of disasters, um, but talks about the politics of a non naive radical hope um, and points us to thinking about restorative environmental justice and the anchor organization is Uprose in New York City. So the book, I think, argues simply that justice is, um, uh, environmental justice and climate justice are freedom movements. Um, they're freedom struggles that are particularly significant now. They're intersectional and they cross time and space. Justice provides a soundtrack of freedom against violence, but also for freedom capaciously defined. So what does it mean to say that environmental justice and climate justice are freedom movements? Um, they, what they do is reject emotions of despair, as they always have. Um, their modes are principled resistance, um, principled resistance, survival, life affirmation against capital accumulation and economic growth, and solidarities that are based on radical empathy, humor, grace, and transformation, um, what I call a politics of a non-naive radical hope. It's not naive because it's grounded in lived experience and in generational trauma and violence. Um, it's radical because the politics refuse a reformist tinkering of making unjust systems more tolerable, um, more racially diverse, and basically like a, like a solid, gentler version of um, injustice. And th this non-naive radical hope are politics based on resistance and solidarity between communities and ecosystems made already vulnerable to social injustice and environmental violence. Um, uh, in Ugly Freedoms, the recent book, um, political scientist Libby Anker examines the various appeals to freedom in contemporary U.S. political thought and how ideologies and practices of um, American freedom legitimate other forms of oppression. And she writes, and this is a quote from Anker, stories about freedom, about people's imbrication in something called nature and about political agency are important for climate um, politics. Um, because any large scale effort to halt global warming depends upon reworking the stories underpinning destructive relationships of the planet 
and reworking stories about freedom, end quote. In other words, um, how we tell stories of freedom matter. Um, in the book, A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal, Naomi Klein um, calls the environmental movement imaginatively asphyxiated. So what does it mean to think about climate justice and what version of climate justice are we talking about? Um, in a contrast, the denuded apolitical generic climate justice, frontline and fenceline climate justice uh, movements argue for a fundamentally different worldview and stories of freedom that exist within the current economic, political, and cultural system. Anker posits and frontline climate justice movements confirm that, quote, if the freedom to participate in and help compose a world alongside others is promised on a subject that is not a masculinized heroic individual who self-wills his action, but a collaborative amalgamation of acts for many human and non-human creatures that form an agentic ecosystem, then different stories of freedom will emerge from that vision. So these um, you know, visions of freedom manifest really differently when you look at things like the Green New Deal, et cetera. Um, it could look really different in terms of labor, uh, a jobs guarantee, technology, including a homes guarantee, and dismantling of fossil fuel companies and, um, and uh, private utilities. So some have argued for a real radical and effective Green New Deal that offers unique um, and utopian visions of freedom for climate justice, grounded in freedoms from fear, freedom from toil, freedom to move, and freedom to live. So environmental justice as freedom, as a freedom struggle, means um, engaging with history, violence, imaginary, and visionary perspectives. So environmental justice, in other words, um, to use Ra Raymond Williams' term, is a structure of feeling. Uh, this, I always like to include this, whether or not it makes any sense in the paper that I'm giving at any given time, but I was kind of struck by this. Um, so the US um, and militarism is a key part of the story. So the United States is responsible for 25% of cumulative carbon emissions in 1780. So again, 25% of cumulative carbon emissions since 1750. Until 1882, the largest emitter was the UK at the height of empire. Mm -hmm. Currently, the US military has 800 military bases around the world, which by itself would be the 58th highest carbon emitter of its own country. Um, the US military is positioned to secure access to oil and extractive resources for the US military, which has the single largest footprint, carbon footprint of any entity on earth. So why do climate justice matter? And what does it mean to talk about a just transition through a critical climate justice lens? Um, environmental justice and climate justice uh, movements matter always. They always have, and but they're specifically and particularly now, um, in part because they connect issues of time and space and they offer the soundtrack of freedom of indigenous people, women, the young, and many others against mar markets, whiteness, and carbon addiction. Um, so this is just a short sampling of the environmental justice and climate justice movements, um, struggles, um, and manifestos, which are pretty available online. Some of you are probably familiar with the 1991 principles of environmental justice, the 2002 principles of working together, which I think this is the key quote from that one. We need each other and we are stronger with each other. The Hamas principles for democratic organizing, um, at the Bali principles for um, climate justice, the indigenous principles of just transition, um, the 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 black the movement for Black Lives has um, also uh, produced some recent interesting um, statements as well. So I think you know if you look at care, uh, carefully and read the movement manifestos from the environmental justice and the climate. Um, justice movements, you will see this idea of that the struggles are linked, um, that closing borders is not the answer. And what is now, you know, more people understand in a moment of um, COVID, uh, what self-care and mutual aid looks like that's communal and not just um, sort of individualized. Um, so environmental justice and climate justice movements, theories and perspectives are well suited then not just for understanding what we're going through in our current moment of danger, but in fighting it. 
the interconnectedness of deeply rooted crises of climate change, toxicity, global white supremacy, and the rise of authoritarian populism is ever clearer. And scholars are linking COVID, climate, and violence in important ways. COVID and climate change are co-produced crises which necess necessitate intersectional analyses of overlapping and uneven conditions of great harm. Where justice movements matter, is in rejecting the naturalization of disproportionate harm, whether that's climate or COVID, and in rejecting never-ending death and destruction. Whereas the dominant response is to normalize the shifting baselines of acceptable COVID deaths or degrees temperature warmed, warmed, justice movements connect seemingly acceptable sets of facts, like COVID or land loss due to rising sea levels, and reject these as inevitable or acceptable. And I don't have time to play this right now, but one of my favorite um, poems, and I think really captures the kind of soundtrack of freedom, is um, was read in 2014 at the UN Climate Summit, summit by a 26-year-old Marshallese poet, um, uh, Kathy uh, Neal, uh, read a poem to her seven-month daughter. Um, and it's really beautiful um, and hopeful, but also urgent. Um, so climate justice movements um, envision and act upon this politics of a non-naive radical hope to build on capacious foundations of art, love, creativity, um, restoration, political resistance, collaborative relationships, and humor in the face of this climatist global present that is built upon the funeral pyres of colonialism and capitalism dependent on stolen land and labor. Frontline activists, um, Climate justice activists foreground their perspectives to argue that they have to lead policy, practice, and worldviews into this just transition, which they define capaciously to include but not be limited to a post-carbon world. This agenda of decarbonization, frontline um, climate justice ar activists argue, is not just about carbon, but a different vision of the world against whiteness, oil, and capitalism. They distinguish their position against mainstream technologically driven conversations on climate policy, um, which has been called, um, some of you are familiar with this term, carbon fundamentalism. And the simplification of carbon neutrality as a proxy for social justice um, in, for example, dominant framings of climate refugees. And there's a really great important book by Neil Ahuja called Planetary Specters, which really looks at the climate refugee as a political problem through a lens of ethnic studies. Um, and so there is important theoretical and praxis oriented work that's already being done around critical climate justice. Again, the, um, I'll talk about this in a second, the indigenous principles of just transition, um, move uh, networks like the dissenters, um, alliances like the Indigenous Environmental um, Network, the Climate Justice Alliance, Just Transition Alliance, the Red Deal for Climate Justice from the Red Nation, and the Red, Black, and Green New Deal in the movement from Black Lives. So this is uh, from the Movement Generation, which is a collective based in Oakland. And when they talk about Just Transition, they have this whole critique of what they call the extractive economy and what they're moving towards. So again, the critique um, of uh, the problem, but also what we're moving towards. And so if you look at it closely, you have the um, extractive economy around dig, burn, and dump, which is oil. We, we understand that. But their other pillars of the extractive economy include consumerism and colonial mindset, enclosure of wealth and power, and militarism. So their idea of a just transition, again, is much broader than just looking at carbon. In other words, just transition is not just an, a solar version of the world we live in now that preserves inequality and hierarchy um, specifically. So social movements, um, critical climate justice um, frameworks link, again, political and cultural struggles for decarbonization, decarceration, demilitarization, and domination over nature within abolitionist and decolonial frameworks. Decarceration, a world without prisons and prince, uh, policing. Demilitarization, a world without war and violence. And domination, a world where nature is abused and extracted through and beyond carbon are interlinking problems. A just world for cl frontline climate justice activists is a remade world, one that takes decolonial feminist and abolitionist perspectives as their base for climate struggles and political transformation to overturn the legacies of colonialism, anti-Blackness, labor exploitation, and continuing abuses of nature. Critical climate justice thus rejects hierarchical and global white supremacist visions of carbon, military, 
policing prisons and human hierarchy over nature. To do so brings us as um, into an emancipatory future as guests rather than hosts and dominators of the, of the planet. So critical climate justice um, offers life upholding visions of freedom that draw from many different versions of freedom. One um, that's not just consumptive sovereignty in Anker's word, or the freedom to conquer nature by consuming objects one desires, to, bends, to bend the world to one's will by devouring resources however one chooses, but of what she calls militant collective action that's invested in rehabilitating ecosystems and decarbonizing the economy, grounded in non-sovereign sovereignty, solidarity and radical mutuality between diverse bodies that are connected by air, water, microbes, toxins, and other bodies. So the tensions of freedom are of uh, freedom from, um, negative, racial capitalism, colonial extraction, whiteness, and freedom to, freedom to love, regenerate, and rebuild social and economic systems, um, and to live in community and practicing solidarity with communities and ecosystems already made vulnerable to abuse, extraction, and violence. Um, so critical climate justice you know, calls, I think, on love, regeneration, and solidarity as counter hegemony. Um, of course, that's Gramsci's notion of hegemony as this process um, of how uh, there's change over time and how the common sense becomes naturalized and is actually a product of institutional and historical forces that are complex and contradictory. But more than institutions, critical climate justice movements reject the legacy of colonialism, human domination of nature, including gender dimensions of violence, fossil fuel extraction, and white supremacy as forces that have to be remade and dismantled. Um, co so why counter hegemony matters? Um, it matters in, in institutions, but it has to grow first in the mind as a possibility of alternative futures. So the task of imaginative freedom is, is central. And that's why climate negativity and climate nihilism is so dangerous. Climate cynicism, attachment to capitalist domination, and fidelity to authoritarian populism as politically inevitable work together to defang political opposition to dominant structures of power and its attendant institutions. Um, and so climate justice is a world-making um, project that's based on freedom. Within the US, the climate justice um, offers transformative justice approaches to climate change that, again, are aligned with feminist, decolonial, and anti-capitalist um, critique from the global south. And so climate justice movements name their enemies pretty clearly. Neoliberalism, corporate polluters, neglectful policy structures. Um, they rally against capitalists, privatization proponents, real estate developers, gentrific uh, gentrifiers, racist cops, including border control, border patrol, and um, detention. They imagine the world they want to make, one that's feminist, anti-racist, and indigenous-led, that lives with not in hierarchical domination to nature's animals and ecosystems. And so here are some images of, um, I think, the critical climate justice as a culture. Um, if those of you haven't watched uh, Sorry to Bother You, it's a pretty uh, interesting anti-capitalist film from 2018 by um, Boots, uh, directed by Boots Riley. Um, and the center is um, an amazing web series uh, that comes out of movement generation, which is that radical collective that produced the uh, just transition framework. It's a seven part, seven minute YouTube series on climate justice called the North Pole. Um, and it links gentrification and climate change um, through the four main characters um, in it. And so here's uh, the North Pole. And so the North Pole is an area of Oakland, which is very vulnerable to gentrification. And three of the four characters are Black and Latinx, and one of them is undocumented um, residents of Oakland. And they align themselves with you know, this kind of uh, polar bear who is actually, um, the voice is um, Boots Riley, who's the director of Sorry to Bother You. So there's actually institutional and cultural links around this. Um, if I have time, I'll show you the Boots Riley. Uh, that's actually Boots Riley right here. Um, up uh, here, uh, the movement generation is really interested in creating a culture of climate justice and activism that speaks to young people and that is political and satirical. 
1491 is an all indigenous comic group um, where one of the comics is Dallas Goldtooth. Dallas Goldtooth is the son of um, Tom Goldtooth, who was one of the founders of the Indigenous Environmental Network. He was very, very prominent during Standing Rock. And he's actually a hugely prominent now in popular culture. So he's in Reservation Dogs and you know a bunch of other very well-known um, things, uh, acts of culture that are being produced. Um, and then there's another down there is this comedy series um, called Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave, which takes place in Norfolk, Virginia, which is a comedy um, for Black comedians talking about climate justice. So climate justice um, alliances um, and uh, creators, cultural creators are creative in their analysis and their structure. They imagine politics differently to nurture and create this convergence of frontline worldview. Um, without naming that as such, their worldviews are indebted to prefigurative radical thinkers like Grape Sleeve Boggs, who wrote um, that the genuine revolutionary task is to try to live now as we want to live in a future society rather than waiting for it to be realized. And so critical climate justice um, really focuses, again, on the kind of global networks, its relationship to Buen Vivir and other global antecedents in this um, global south. Uh, it's connected to those in the small island states around the world. Um, and ultimately, the call is for responsibility, restoration, and repair that are politically and culturally significant, um, an internationalism from below. Um, climate justice um, movements, again, um, really matter because what they do is um, create a principled base from which to face our collective planetary future. Living in denial does not make the problem, whether that's climate change or COVID, go away, notwithstanding the shifting baselines that normalize math's death or temperatures degrees worn. Although most people in the US would prefer to ignore our histories and our deaths to each other, as well as our relation to the rest of the world, the climate science is clear and the justice activists are absolutely and resolutely right. Um, so James Baldwin, the author, uh, wrote, people who shut their eyes to reality invite their own destruction. And anyone who is remaining in a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead, turns himself into a monster. Now, and this is, of course, the, the famous Gramsci um, quote, the old world is dying, the new world is um, struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. Now is the moment of monsters and those who seek to make their monstrosity seem logical, acceptable, and normal. But justice movements have always reminded us in their placards, music, and stories and poems against this monstrosity in things as simple as people and planet over profits. In 1938, Langston Hughes wrote his famous poem, Kids Who Die, which had a second life, you know, I think after Trayvon Martin um, was murdered by the police. And whenever there's a police murder um, in the US, it, it kind of comes up a lot in social media. The poem opens, this is for the kids who die, black and white, for kids will die certainly. The old and rich will live on a while, as always, eating blood and gold, letting kids die. Hughes, Langston Hughes, James Baldwin, and climate justice activists everywhere remind us that the old and the rich eat their blood, they eat their gold, and they eat their oil, while kids, usually Black, Brown, and Indigenous, die. And this horror should be recognized as a monstrosity. Environmental justice and climate justice um, movements, cultures, and worldviews are counter-hegemonic -hegem philosophy of practice, a search for freedom beyond local communities fighting bad environmental or regulatory systems. It's not just about state-centered policy and corporation reformism. Rather, they challenge the status quo. Rather than fixing and tinkering within a system that's based on domination, racial terror, and uh, colonial colonialism. So their vision for environmental justice is against eating blood, gold, and oil, and for making care, food, work, energy, and lives matter, not cheap, disposable, and dead. This is an old idea. It's not a new one. And it's worth remembering our collective past as a set of practitioners interested in justice of all stripes. Radical freedom activists have long known how revolutionary politics is performative and cultural. And I don't have time to talk about Benjamin Lay, but for those of you who don't know him, you should learn about, um, he's a lot of the reason why the Quakers became abolitionists. Um, the lessons of the environmental justice and the critical climate justice movements are that the struggles of people and community um, who are made vulnerable to violence and whose continued survival is a direct challenge 
to the political and economic order addicted to capitalism, carbon, and white supremacy. We have to listen to the environmental justice and climate justice movements because they've been fighting for a very long time. What they do is challenge the authorities of whiteness, extraction, and violence through diverse stories, media, and perspectives. They make art. They bring people together. They are um, affirming in protest in an extractive capitalist context that invites the deaths, that revels in it, that's structured around it, of nature, peoples, and planet. Feeling for others lead us away from this death cult of whiteness, carbon addiction, and capitalism. And this empathy is in too far short a supply embedded in, into the political and economic systems that structure our lives. Colonialism and slavery left ongoing legacies of economic extraction that rendered organized violence normal. But justice movements reject that common sense of capitalism and such abstraction. Now is the moment of monsters and those who seek to, their, to make their monstrosity seem acceptable, logical, and normal. But justice movements remind us in Again, why we should reject the slow deaths and the fast violence everywhere. The environmental justice is about living and loving beyond the shadows and the numbers and about love and creation in a moment that fetishizes death and spurns care. It's about reclaiming the ethics of morality and widening the circles to respect land and home and to acknowledge trauma and history. Our urgency now is to maximize our collective convergence towards an ethics of care in the spirit of solidarity and to bend the arc of justice and freedom from oil and all forms of extraction, hierarchy, and violence. The time is now. I'll end it there and then take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions and comments. Um, I'd love to um, ask students particularly if there are any here, if they have any or prioritize student voices um, first, but of course all questions and comments are welcome. I'll wait a little bit to let people's thoughts settle. Mark, go ahead. Thanks, Randy, and thanks, Julie, for uh, a great talk. Um, my question, I guess, is about, um, or I guess asking you to talk a little bit through what is maybe a tension in between thinking about climate justice as a freedom movement and thinking about it as uh, a, a set of practices that leads toward emancipation. Um, and as part of that, your assertion that part of this means a rejection of the inevitability of things like sea level rise and a, and a, and a world of whatever, increasing scarcity, deprivation, all those kinds of things. Um, and this kind of emerging literature within sociology anyway of a sociology of loss that actually sort of requires us to grapple with or acknowledge that whatever kind of a future we move into, while there may be dimensions or axes on which there is improvement and movements towards freedom, there is also going to be increasing pressures around deprivation and loss and want because whatever environmental future we move into uh, is on a global scale anyway, likely to be worse than it is today and increasingly worse with every day that we don't bring down emissions. So, um, and normally when we think about freedom movements and we think about emancipation, at least on the sort of big historical scheme, we, we think about futures that are better, globally better, universally better, better for, for everybody. Um, and it's, a little bit tricky to imagine how that is the case in a, in a situation in which the context of our lives, um, no matter what structures, no matter what kinds of forms of political organization we have, uh, is made more difficult um, by climatic instability. So I, I just wonder if you can talk a little bit through the tension between those two things. Yeah, I think that, you know, that's an important um, question, and it's kind of one of the main ones, but I think 
how you answer that question is shaped by the who the we is and who whose norms and values and life systems are prioritized. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I know that you know this and everybody on this call, you know, understands that, but that this is not, um, not everybody has the same level of responsibility and accountability and contribution to the problem. And so, you know, the, the idea that like, this is like a global we, I mean, there's pretty strong critique of, you know, the Anthropocene concept, right? That, you know, this is indigenous people and, you know, people from the global South have not contributed to this, you know, that this is about historical, and that's where the, the time and space um, issue is so important. And so, you know, if you look at, and this is the, the fight, you know, obviously right now about um, climate, um, who pays and climate reparations and so on. Um, and so I think, you know, the, I, I think it's very complicated because, I mean, that my second book was looking at an eco city in China. You know, and so it's this exact moment that, you know, the U.S. isn't, you know, is the second, you know, but that, but historically, you know, if China is the biggest um, carbon emitter, they're also because it's tied to a global system of production and extraction and, you know, for a global economics, they're like the world's factory and so on. And so you can't think of emissions just in a spatial context. You have to think of it in a temporal, you know, and in and a historical one. And so that makes this very, very fraught, right? Um, because we're not talking just about, you know, the, the reparations um, conversation and fight is a very, very important one. And it's not just about climate reparations, it's about reparations for, you know, enslavement, 4, 000, uh, 400 years of modernity, you know, and the, the way that the society has been structured globally. And so, you know, I think that we're looking at like the biggest, you know, historical, political, you know, uh, geographical um, questions. And so obviously there's gonna be like nasty fights about it. But honestly, you know, if we just think about emissions as a geographic one without looking at the temporal scale, it makes no sense, you know, politically. Um, I wrote the China book because I was very, very concerned about how China was being like carbon bashed. Like there was all this kind of discourse that was like racializing China at the same time that, you know, I understand that like what China does and, you know, it shapes the world in such a massive way. And so, you know, how do you um, take all of these factors into account and sort of translate this into policy? Obviously, you know, that's not a simple, these aren't simple, right? These aren't simple questions. These are the biggest ones. Um, but to me, the climate justice movement um, is my guide. That's how I was raised. You know, that's my worldview is around climate justice movements. And so climate justice movements would look at that question that you asked and say, well, you know, not everybody does this, it has the same harm. And actually you have to put the people who are harmed first at the forefront, you know, and if you believe as the climate justice movement argues that they are the solutions, you know, they offer the solutions, then, you know, that would shape different assumptions about transportation, you know, about private ownership, um, we're not just looking at like, we get to all live the same life that we have, you know what I mean? Because there's been so much inequality around it. So, I mean, I don't know, this is not, um, these are not, you know, these are the kind of biggest ethical, you know, political, um, historical questions, you know, at all. But I think what's important is that there not be a reflexive, like, oh, I don't understand why reparations is part of this conversation. Do you know what I mean? Or that this is a techno fix. Like all we need to do is make like the transportation, like if we all just had electric vehicles, everything would be fine. Do you know what I mean? That's what, you know, it's not, a, it's not a technological question. These aren't technological questions. I mean, technology is part of it, but it can't be the primary mode of it. And the carbon policy, um, the dominant way that it's it's talked about is as engineering or um, sort of carbon, you know, measuring in that way, and that that's it's important, absolutely. But it can't it that's not the base of what's going to move 
you know, in a big picture sense. I mean, I think there's a lot of discussions about, you know, what growth looks like, and they're they're true within certain fields like economics and stuff. You know, the 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 gospel of growth. Um, there's a lot of um, accountability within econ as a profession to sort of look at what are the mantras, you know, that sort of guide you know, the, the assumptions of how economies are supposed to grow and so on. There's a lot of discussion about, you know, subsistence um, economies and peasant um, cultures and, you know, what did, what did globalization do um, to them and so on. So I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has to be on the table, but the idea, you know, I was re just reading in the paper the other day about Switzerland, you know, they're basically, you know, doing the thing as kind of a version of the market trading, you know, they want to get, they're not going to change their quality of life or how they live, you know, they're basically just going to pay for poor countries in the global South to do that. Um, and so that, that, that's to me is like, you know, sure, it's pragmatic, but there's also a lack of um, accountability. Do you know what I mean? Like, you can't just like pay to have, you know, your, it's like an indulgence. It's like a middle age indulgence, you know, you like you're paying for it. Do you know what I mean? Um, so anyway, that wasn't an answer to a question. It was more like the climate justice movements would always say, well, who is, who is the we and who is the us and how do we live? And, you know, they would say there isn't a shared experience of that. So I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Not. Th thanks very much. I, I won't take up much time. I guess part of what I'm asking is whether or not you think that that our uh, uh, that sort of our understanding of justice is being constrained into a distributive question of who's going to bear. The harms, right? Like the yes, there's all that history of who's benefited and and, and who has borne the cost of it, and that's going to magnify. I think as we move forward, that's going to become more acute. Those kinds of questions, um, but freedom movements, of course, are much more expansive than those than those distributive questions. So I, I guess I was just trying to get at that little bit of tension in between imagining climate justice as a freedom movement that's about universal emancipation, and then dealing with also the sort of increasingly acute distributional questions around harm and benefit that neoliberal capitalism presents us with, if that's the future that we intend to, to sort of go it's, with. It's not, is it a tension though? I mean, not, don't all movements have those differences? You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't necessarily see that as a tension. It's just more like, you know, uh, I, I sort of see, I saw this article once that said all hands on deck, you know, everybody does what they can, you know, um, but I think, the um i don't i don't know maybe it is attention i have to think about it more but thank you thank you thanks mark we have a hand up from maya wheeler hi can you hear me okay <clears throat> thank you so much uh that was wonderful your work is is so great especially um to teach it just gives so much it, it's such a great guide uh, to just get people excited about what's possible. So thank you so much. Um, and like, thank you for that great overview. M my question, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to articulate it, uh, cause it's something that I've just been struggling with myself. Um, so uh, I just finished my PhD, just to give a bit of background in oil and gas um, extraction here uh, in Manitoba, Canada, uh, and especially, the only kind of oil and gas here is is uh, fracking. So, you know, a multi-site sort of hydraulic fracturing, which is diffused across landscape. And uh, my question is, you know, there's there's so much really cool climate justice, climate activism um, that you speak to. Uh, but in my work, I was preoccupied with the the divisive, the other side, the 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 people who um, have mob have been used to mobilize um, against climate activism, uh, who come out of you know who are oil workers who are dependent on oil communities, and you know obviously there's like a lot of um, good thinking that has already been done about you know why why uh, people are dependent on oil and how how they are made this way. Um, but I just wonder, um, how do we sort of 
speak to, I guess uh, we could uh, call them the settlers in the settler society. Uh, and I guess I'm speaking more to a North American kind of situation where you have people who um, have privilege because they they own land and they are getting, you know, um, they're benefiting in some ways. But a lot of the people that I spoke to are also dealing with the the continued sort of march of the empire. So the slowly being disinherited from the land and dealing with the costs of extraction. And so in some ways, it, it was this uh, paradox where uh, the people that I spoke to were quite critical of oil and gas and, you know, probably, you know, very on board with things like just transition. And yet at the same time, they often are catalyzed, you know, to be against this kind of movement. There's this sort of, I don't know, Eva Mackey, I've been reading from Unsettled uh, Expectations, is these like expectations, these settler expectations. Anyways, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about um, speaking to people who are not in the climate, climate justice activism group and yet, you know, need to be or should be catalyzed. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. And um, I put in the chat a special issue from um, American Quarterly, which I co-edited with Mike Zeiser and Natasha Zaretsky, so a literary scholar and an energy historian. And we did, a uh, it's called Energy Past and Futures. And it's actually not primarily about climate or carbon, you know, but sort of energy more broadly defined. But when you were talking, it reminded me of this one piece by Sylvia Ryerson about coal mining in West Virginia and the affective, she calls it affective identification, you know, with oil uh, and sort of why the, um, and that's why I spent so much time talking um, with about Libby Franker's, uh, uh, Anker's book, Ugly Freedom. You know, because a lot of this is, and we know this because of the elections, you know, that national elections, um, that this is very much about um, affective um, politics, you know, and sort of that feeling of connection or lack of connection or that feeling of, you know, being left behind or, you know, you're not part of this future. And that's very much tied to generation, race, gender, um, and, you know, all kinds of um, vectors of um, not identity, but sort of, um, you know, it comes off, it feels like it's identity, but it's actually, you know, much more than just identity. Um, and so I think, you know, it's really important um, for, for us, you know, to think about, like, what is it that makes people feel like, um, the you aren't left behind in this future. And, you know, California, where I'm at, has a very, very, very strong oil industry, which a lot of people don't know. Um, but, you know, the oil industry is, you know, in the same areas that have the really in industrial agriculture in the Southern San Joaquin. And so there's a lot of um, coalition movement and work that's being done around, um, you know, Basically, that on the one hand, you have, you know, the bans on gas cars in California. On the other hand, you have this really active oil industry that's killed off all kinds of attempts to, you know, have buffer zones between the, the drilling sites and the local communities. You know, you have entire, you know, oil towns that are still, you know, really based on that. Um, and it's, it's really about, you know, the kind of sense of... Um, like being anchored in an institution and a history and a sort of reliability and connection. Um, that's, you know, that's, it's, it's emotional. It's not just, you know, it's like being a prison guard or something, you know, or a police um, member or a member in the military. It's like, it's a deeply, deeply, deeply lived experience. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of um, attempts right now to think about transition work you know, for the oil workers down there. And there's a lot of pushback against it. So, you know, the, um, the emotional part of it is something that has to be really thought of. So, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you're going to throw into like training folks for different kinds of labor. You know, this is really, really the affective um, dimension of it is, is, is huge. And so I think, you know, not to like reduce things to like generational, you know, 
um, fights or, you know, racial, you know, it, it's, it's all of those things together. So there isn't really, um, you know, I don't really have an answer other than to say, like, if you ignore, you know, the emotional stuff, like, you're not going to get very far, you know, um, politically or pragmatically. Um, and so um, the, I think that's why the work um, of scholars um, who think about affect and emotion are, you know, that work is so important. Um, it's also why the culture around youth organizing um, really matters and why I spend a lot of time talking about like climate justice, hip hop and, you know, poet spoken word and slam, you know, um, because it's also how um, different uh, movements build themselves, you know. And so for me, I spend less time thinking about those folks who feel alienated, you know, than I do about building the movements. But that's just because of where I, where my research is focused on, you know, is mostly around movements and, and young people. And it's been like that for a long time. So um, I don't, I think you're pointing out to something really, really important. And I don't, I just don't know um, as much of that work, you know, um, but I think, you know, Sarah Jaquette Ray's Field Guide to Climate Anxiety and all the climate anxiety and youth um, work, you know, I, it would be interesting to see if the anxieties manifest differently for um, generationally. And, and because I do think there's a lot of kind of robust scholarship around climate anxiety and youth culture and stuff. So I wonder if the, this other, the affective identification with like the oil work is also a form of, um, if you could think of it through climate anxiety too, you know, I, I don't know, actually, that's just something that your question spurs for me, but it's a really interesting one. I, you know, you should read that's, that's Ryerson piece on coal. Thank you, Maya. I was listening to, I think it was CDC the other day that, that has, has, um, that identified a new branch of therapy around climate anxiety. Um, there are people like, ther like therapists who deal specifically with that. Uh, we have, and the conversation that you two are having just um, reminds me also that, um, you know, what, what I think is so valuable about your work, Julie, is that you theorize through organizing and the long histories of organizing, and you don't theorize through histories of oppression per se. And I think about that in my teaching as well. Like if you can teach through oppression, um, which it, it feels overwhelming, or you can teach through long histories of struggle and survival. And I, I feel like your work really uh, switches because, you know, theorizing through struggle is, of course, theor is of course um, theorizing through oppression, but through the lens of the people who have been doing this work for, for so long. Um, I think following up on uh, Maya's point, there's a question in the chat from someone who doesn't have their audio. Um, they're quoting from a New York Times piece um, on Ron DeSantis, who is possible 2024 presidential candidate and was successfully reelected to Florida as, uh, as Florida's governor. He's, um, the quote is, DeSantis campaigned as an unapologetic culture warrior willing to fight the woke left and defied public health experts during the coronavirus pandemic, end quote. So the question is, how does society actually re-inject facts and compassion into a politically polarized world? So it's following up from, I think, the discussion you just said and from your talk that facts seem to not matter anymore. And this person is asking, do, but don't they? Shouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, it, it would be great if it did. When I tell my class, you know, when I teach, I, I talk about facts, opinions, and arguments. And most of the time I spend focusing on the learning the difference between opinions and arguments. And I said, you know, we're in a university, we live in argument land. You know, we don't live, everybody's has an opinion, but you know, we we make, we have questions, we have arguments, and it's based on evidence. And what does that mean in a cultural context? Because most people don't understand what that means, you know, in a humanities or cultural context. Never <laughs> until 2016 did I think that we had to like talk about facts. Do you know what I mean? And so I, it's, it's very hard because in my classroom, I go, well, okay, well, we accept facts. I'm not going to argue certain facts with you. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then we're still going to mostly focus on opinions and arguments. Of course, my classroom is a little bit of a bubble and a university is a bubble where that is a shared, like, belief system, I think, I hope, you know, but that's why there are so many attacks on universities. Um, as, you know, 
for us being part of the culture war and so on, you know? Um, I think that that question, um, you know, is a really, really important one. And the, the universities are really, really, I mean, if, if Trump had been elected again in 2020, you know, there's no doubt in my mind, like what would have happened next? Like for all, in terms of like our, my world as in academia, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, so obviously things are not linear, you know, they don't go like from better to work, uh, from worse to better, you know, these things go in waves. And that's why, you know, we have to understand, you know, the histories, even if you're not primarily a historian. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the, you know, this is how Reagan came to power, was attacking, was reacting to um, social movements that came out of the University of California system. You know, these things are cyclical and they will never go away. The question is, where is the, the middle bit, you know, that and how many people I, I try to explain to my students about like hegemony and counter hegemony, you know, and I'm like, look, hegemonic doesn't mean everybody believes it. <laughs> you know what I mean? In any given time, no, you never had like universal belief in X, Y, or Z. You always, always had people for whom it didn't make sense, you know, or it didn't quite fit. And so I think, you know, again, I'm not a political scientist, but the struggle is really over that, that 25, you're always going to have 25% that believes whatever they believe you know, that are going to be completely against facts. Do you know what I mean? And then you have, you know, another, like you have the extremes on both ends of the spectrum. Really, you're fighting for that like middle bit, you know? Um, and so there, there are people who are not going to believe in facts, whatever you, whatever you say, you know? And then you're people who are, you know, um, to um, fight over that and stuff. So I think, you know, your the, the person's comment and question is really important. It reminds us, like, we don't want to end up in having a kind of simplistic, like, oh, well, Trump was repudiated and therefore X, Y, or Z. Or, or now everything's fine in Brazil because Bolsonaro is out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's not, that's not the way it works. You know what I mean? And so I think we just have to figure out and learn um, from our own past and from other global pasts. I I am continually like I was reading about New Zealand. You know, everybody got progressive. It's like, oh, I want to go to New Zealand. You know how they dealt with their COVID policy, blah 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 blah. But I was reading something, you know, just about how they were pretty divided and fractious, like into the '80s, and then they restructured their political system, you know, to sort of move away from this. And I had no idea. You know, I didn't know that history. Why would I? I don't know anything about New England's, you know, hit political structure. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so it was really interesting, though, because then I was thinking about why and how it is that, you know, we have now this idea of like, oh, New Zealand's this like progressive utopia and how divided it was, you know, in terms of um, all kinds of politics, but including guns and, you know, lots of um, kind of dark, uh, you know, trends of violence and, you know, uh, and so on. So this is a long answer to say, um, yes, there will always be people who don't believe in facts and don't believe, you know, in research and don't believe in, you know, that the, what we have to do matters, you know, in, in this sphere. Um, and then there are those who, you know, what we're trying to struggle for is over the, the, um, is, is the middle like 20, you know, and that's the part that actually matters a lot. Uh, and whether or not, you know, we can or can't, or whether the U.S. is too structured, you know, in the Constitution, you know, around it, and there's any chance away from this kind of hyperpolarization, you know, the, again, those are like the massive, um, you know, questions. Um, but what what's clear is that, you know, we don't have um, a lot of time. And, you know, I don't understand, you know, why you know, I don't, I don't, I have, I've ceased understanding how, trying to understand how things work. I just keep on doing the thing that I do. And, you know, the, I've been working on environmental justice, you know, since I was like, you know, eight, 18, 19, maybe. And I have seen that the world has changed in terms of understanding the things that movements have been arguing for, for a long time. And so that continues to be kind of gratifying to me. I talked about the Hurricane Katrina example mostly to point at my own, you know, innocence. Do you know what I mean? And it was the kind of innocence that I remember, you know, when I was in undergrad and people were talking about needing to, 
like take, you know, the big video cameras, like, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the big, big video cameras, like needing to tape the police in Oakland. And I grew up in Chinatown in a working class community. I understand, you know, classism, xenophobia, anti-Chinese, you know, politics. I understood racism, but I didn't understand anti-Black racism. That wasn't my experience. I didn't come from that community. But I remember going to Berkeley and having folks say, okay, well, there was cop watch and you had to bring your big camera to go watch the cops in Oakland. And I remember thinking, why? Why? I was 18. You know, I was like, why? Why would you need to watch the cops? Do you know what I mean? Now, right? Like, of course, people knew back then. Black people knew, you know, others did. I didn't. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't. And so that's my own innocence, right? You know, that was that moment where I'm like in that James Baldwin quote, like I can know and I can just like act like I don't know and just go ahead with my life. Do you know what I mean? Or I could say, look, this is, there's something that is so wrong that I cannot do whatever I thought I was going to do in my life, you know, and that that's what I chose to do and stuff. So all, all I do is try to just do the same thing that I've done for like 29 years. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And understanding that things do change. Um, there is more acceptance, awareness that these are problems and that there are more people and institutions that are trying to deal with them. And there's always going to be a reaction and a pushback. You know, um, you don't have Trump without, you know, you have Trump right after Obama and so on, you know. So we what we can have is that innocence, again, that teleological belief in like a sort of narrative of getting better. <laughs> You know what I mean? What we have to understand is that, you know, these are nasty fights that are going to be persistent until, you know, if and when something happens and, you know, maybe there'll be some political shift as in New Zealand did in the 80s to decide that like this doesn't make sense. Like it takes up a lot of, you know, political capital and time, you know, that we could actually spend dealing with problems, you know. Um, again, I can have my cynical, like that's not going to happen thing, but I, I prefer to follow the, the ethics and the culture of the social movements, which is that non-naive radical hope, you know, it's not delusional, it's political. Um, and within that, there is still an optimism and a understanding of violence, but there, but it's not going to like keep you from functioning and wanting to like die in the hole. You know what I mean? Like wanting to die in the hole doesn't get you anywhere at all. And Dallas Goldtooth has this really great quote about how his organizing work um, in Keep It in the Ground is tied to his comedian work. You know, and he talks about like comedy and relating to people and laughing is how you survive when everybody wants you to be dead. You know, you got to make jokes about stuff because otherwise you know, you will just want to mass suicide yourself. And that that's not going to be helpful to anybody except the people in power who want you to be dead anyway. And so if you're an anti-authoritarian, which is my tendency, I'm anti-authoritarian by personality, you know, if people want you to be dead because your, you know, land has been taken or your labor is not useless, you know, and if people want you dead anyway, I'm not going to want to mass suicide myself. I want to be like, you know, screw you. I mean, and stuff. So anyway, I don't know if that was helpful or a, a rambling tirade. It, it probably is uh, on the edge of rambling tirade. Land. It could be both. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. And it reminds you bring up New Zealand and it reminds me of how, from what I know of abolitionist history, penal abolitionist history, New Zealand is one of the first places that really took uh, restorative justice practices ser seriously in a way that, um, you know, other nations or other communities or are catching up with in some ways. And so what you're talking about reminds me of what you alluded to that this critical climate justice movement um, has similar methodologies as a, an abolitionist movement um, in terms of thinking about um, you know, justice as a life and practice, not, uh, not, a, not a end point or future goal. Um, that the ways in which we live is, is, is the practice of justice. Um, are there any final questions or comments? Thank you so much, folks, for turning out. I hope that was inspiring and helpful. Um, thank you, thank you so much for coming to visit us um, virtually, Julie. I'm glad that we could make it happen. Thanks, thank folks. For, thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a nice day, folks. Take care.